All right, well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's 1130, so we will go ahead and get started uh, here this morning. First, thank you for taking just a few minutes of your time today to be a part of this event. Uh, I think some of you know that this was a previously scheduled event where our intent was to talk about uh, commercial property taxes and what's going on within our local government uh, entities. Uh, the typical thing that happens this time of year as we think about budgets and things of that nature, but obviously the times have changed uh very quickly so we wanted to still leverage uh, the opportunity that we had this event on all of our community leaders calendars and just quite simply provide it as a platform to share the most uh, timely information out to you all uh, just regarding the current COVID-19 pandemic and how we know it is impacting all of you in different ways uh, we want to give you an opportunity to hear from our local and state uh, officials uh, as to uh, just the latest and greatest. I did not dictate this agenda in any way, but again, I really believe it's important for you to hear from uh, our community leaders. So we're gonna uh, provide that platform. Uh, first, I think many of us are going from one call, one call to the other, to the other, to the other. And uh, oftentimes uh, it, it can be a little heavy, right? We get that. So let me just start by asking how many people had to put a different shirt on to be a part of this conversation today? <laughs> so we're all getting very comfortable with our with our zoom meeting so thank you all of you for joining so um, we'll get right to it our agenda today uh, we're going to start with an update from our community leaders uh, mayor abwasli is on the line uh, followed by our city manager lon pluck on then we're going to hear some quick updates from our school leadership uh, janelle brower uh, from marion independent school district superintendent uh, is on as well as Shannon Bisgard, superintendent with the Linmar Community School District. And then the last two presenters this morning uh, will be Representative Ashley Hinson and Senator Liz Mathis. Uh, they've done a great job coordinating on how they're going to present some updates from the state level. And then we'll have a few closing comments. We are going to keep um, uh, your lines muted. We would ask if you have any specific questions that we might consider at the end of all of our presentations that you would submit them through the chat feature. Um, so we'll watch those and look for any conversations that we might be able to, uh, questions that we might be able to address in the end. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and open up Mayor Abouassili's line and uh, Mayor Abouassili, thanks for joining us here this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Nick, uh, for uh, hosting this and organizing it. Appreciate uh, being a part of it. Um, it's, uh, I think it, we all understand that this is a very situa a serious situation that we're all in. Uh, prior to uh, the confirmation of the first uh, uh, confirmed case in, in, in Lynn County, uh, the city of Marion has operated under the assumption that the virus was was and is present in our in our community. So we began making plans and making preparations for what was coming and putting uh, procedures in place. Uh, our efforts have been and still are aimed at you know first and foremost keeping people safe, our uh, first our, our employees and as well as the public whom we serve, keeping them all uh, safe. Um, that's the that's the first consideration, and then uh, keeping our essential services operational. So there's a lot that goes on with that. And I'm gonna leave it to the city manager to discuss a lot of those details, but I'm, I'm talking more just in, in generalities. Uh, but of course, it's important to us to keep essential services and uh, uh, operational and serving the, the, the residents of Marion. Um, the other thing is, you know, we're focused on promoting an atmosphere of, of calm uh, without panic while trying to disseminate the information that people need to need to know to to understand the seriousness of, of, of uh, what we're dealing with, as well as what we all can do and that we all do have a role to play. I think that's been a big part of our focus. My put my focus uh, personally in all my communications, every every possible way I, I uh, can find to communicate with people in the community at large, that we all do have a role to play and uh, we can all do our part and 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 we have a greater chance of uh, minimizing the impact on all of us uh, if we all uh, understand the obligation we have to each other as a community and um, do do our part do what we can uh, so to that to that end we've been disseminating the, the you know the, all the 
guidance that's come from the state and the Lynn County uh, Public Health and the healthcare community, uh, trying to just get the information out there to, to um, try to maximize what we all can do on an individual level, whether other individuals or businesses, uh, to uh, to um, help impact, have a positive impact on the outcome. On a regional level, uh, we've recognized the importance of cooperation and coordinating with uh, the other regional entities. If there's ever been a time to to come together and to show unity, this is it. Uh, so we have been coordinating as much as possible with uh, other regional entities and decision makers. We're in constant contact, daily uh, updates, daily meetings uh, and briefings um, on what's going on, uh, what the status is, what the recommended uh, actions are. Uh, we've all seen the press conferences that have been held uh, 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 frequently. There was uh, one yesterday. Um, so we've been coordinating in that in that regard uh we're coordinating with the human services organizations to help to make sure that the people who need help continue uh being served and with the business entities like like metco and the chamber of commerce uh to um, ensure that the businesses are receiving the information that they need and the resources and the, and the help that they need and um uh we've been having daily briefings with metco and and the um, a chamber of commerce uh, on, on all those uh, issues um, our website the city website has been, been uh, a main uh, avenue of communicating with the public where we're trying to put all the resources all the information in one place where people can access uh, access it um, and um, really the, 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 my main point is that the, uh, the big focus now is just to get everyone to understand uh, the impact and the and the and the, the seriousness of, of uh, what we have to deal with, and making sure that people are um, doing their part to help slow the spread. We hear from the medical community, you know, that in three weeks' time, if if we don't all do better in three weeks' time, the medical community could be overwhelmed. The the healthcare system could be overwhelmed. So that's that's really the big push right now is to uh, help people understand what that means. Uh, you know, we could end up with a shortage of healthcare workers. We could end up with shortage of um, hospital beds and equipment that 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 is needed to um, take care of the people who are sick. So uh, that's what I have for now. Uh, we we'll just encourage everyone to, to stay engaged and to stay informed as much as possible, and to uh, every all of us uh, understand what it's going to take from us, each of us personally, to to help um, minimize the impact and get through this period as, as uh, with as least impact as possible. We're not going to avoid we're not going to avoid it, but we want to get get through it with us at least the least impact negative impact as possible. Uh, and then uh, after afterwards, um, help our community recover as quickly as possible. So, thank you. Glad to be here. Mayor Abbasli, thank you uh, for your time this morning. Thanks for your leadership as well. Um, just so you all know, uh, we have an opportunity of having a quick 15 minute check in uh, every day uh, with our city leadership team together with our Chamber of Commerce. So uh, we're doing all we can to stay aligned on kind of all aspects of information. So we we really appreciate that. Um, right now, I'll toss it over to uh, to Lon, who's uh, 30 feet away from me, but very isolated from me. So Lon, the floor is yours. Yeah, we have a uh, quite a few closed doors in between us at this point. Um, I will say it's been an interesting one for us because, you know, for as much as you preach the mantra that uh, your IT staff are critical to your operation, this one really puts that to the test. Um, but I'd also say, you know, that that group, um, if I can stereotype a little bit, tends to socially isolate anyway. So it's a little, little easier for them to continue to do their operations remotely than it is the rest of us because they're just accustomed to it. 
Um, but from the city level, you've probably seen publicly some of the things that we have been doing. Um, we have scaled back a lot of our public services to the point where we're focusing on what we need to do to make sure that we're maintaining health and safety. So that does include things like continuing to pick up garbage from people's homes so that we're promoting safe and sanitary conditions. Uh, you know, I'd say that the press release that we put out where we temporarily relaxed our restrictions on how much people can put out um, sailed to being our most viral or most shared post of all time in very short order, proven to be very popular. So it's surprising what will uh, keep people up. Uh, but we continue to have um, the staff reporting for the water department, the sewer department staff are still reporting. So the ones that work behind the scenes that are less visible than say police and fire are still out there. We've made a lot of adjustments to our workforce to make sure that we continue to have people available to be able to respond. So uh, for example, the fire department and police departments have split their shifts. Um, they're isolating their crews from each other. Um, even in the fire department, we've actually um, started to station people so that they are now responding from their homes rather than responding from the station to different incidents. So uh, we've made a lot of efforts on continuity of operations just to make sure that we can help people out for those emergencies. Now with the uh, fire department in particular, they have the most exposure of any of our services, um, just like ambulance personnel or health services personnel. So we certainly appreciate all the donations that we've received from the business community for personal protective equipment. That's really helped them to uh, maintain their level of service. So far, we've been pretty lucky. Um, we have not had anybody that's on staff test positive for any of it. Um, but I'll say in the last couple of days that the fire department has been responding to more calls um, where people are presenting symptoms that might be consistent. They just haven't been confirmed at this point. I can confirm that we do have cases in Marion. So we do know that it is present in our community. Um, but we've been expecting that. Um, you've probably seen that we closed our playgrounds and thanks to the schools for reaching out to help coordinate activities on that so that we're consistent in our messaging around the city. Um, I will say that that has included our basketball courts. We did close the skate park. So those other areas where people were congregating in larger groups. Um, we have effectively closed those down now as well and we're monitoring them. Uh, I understand last night we had a few kids uh, jump the fence over at the skate park and the police department had to go have a, a short conversation with them about that. So we'll continue to monitor those. Um, from the business community standpoint, one thing that we would really appreciate is if you are going to be closing operations or your buildings are going to be vacant, um, please call the non-emergency number at the police department and let them know so that we can add you to our business checks. We want to make sure that even if you don't have people there that your facilities are secure and safe while you're doing uh, scaled back operations. Um, the other thing I would say that you might notice, um, we are uh, starting over the weekend going to be distributing some of our administrative staff for the emergency services out to other buildings. So if you're walking the trail out at Lau uh, and, and you're thinking that that building is supposed to be closed, um, don't need to call the police department because we're establishing a secondary command center for fire out there. Um, it's been a unique time for us just because Normally, your incidents that you're responding to in Iowa are your physical disasters. You know, you've had a tornado or you've had a flood. And our nature, I think, as Iowans is to want to help and pitch in. So you have a flood, what happens? Everybody gets together at the public services building and we hatch out a response plan and then go out and get to work. But this situation, we simply can't do that. So we've had to um, roll out some new uses of technology. I think. Uh, Coming up on the 9th of August, you'll see our first fully electronic city council meeting. So that will be a bit of an adventure for us as well. Um, but uh, essential services are continuing to run. Um, all of our phone lines are still active. Uh, we don't necessarily have them all um, going specifically to a person, but we are checking voicemail frequently. So if you have any questions, uh, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, if you can't get a hold of a person right away, uh, by all means, leave a voicemail and we will get back to you um, typically within the day, if not a matter of hours. But thanks for all the efforts that you've done as a community to help support us and we'll be doing everything we can to continue to help support you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lon, for that for that update. And again, if anybody has questions they want to submit, um, we'll, we'll reserve the chat feature for that uh, at the end of the meeting. So I want to turn to our K-12 system, uh, the Marion Independent School District and the Bernard Community School District. I know it's a 
somewhat fluid situation, and again, a situation that uh, has never dealt with before. So we will uh, first go to Janelle uh, Brower, uh, Janelle is the superintendent of the area in the school district, and uh, Janelle, the floor is yours this morning. All right, thank you, Nick. I'm going to hope that was your mic that was cutting in and out, and not mine. Can you hear me okay? You, you sound good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so just a few updates from the school perspective, and I know um, Shannon Biscard will be able to follow this. You might hear a little bit of a theme here. Um, I, I will say one of the, um, the silver linings in this is we have a community that is um, incredibly collaborative and supportive, um, and that, that really has been um, just a, a blessing in disguise working through this. Um, I would say that Superintendent Biscard and I have uh, spent a lot of time together in the last few weeks, so um, virtually. So just to stuff, um, as you are well aware, um, the district is currently closed. Um, at the governor's recommendation, we will be closed um, until April 13th. We do anticipate reopening our doors um, on April 13th, but certainly that's something we continue to monitor um, and we'll provide updates if for some reason that would change. Um, where as a district, we are really trying to focus, um, as with most businesses, we have a strategic plan that really um, drives our work. And part of our strategic plan in Marion Independent, um, we have specific goals around providing a safe environment, um, supporting the social, emotional, behavioral needs of each of the learners. Um, we also have a goal around partnership with families and communities. And so those, those two goals have really been the framework for making decisions as to how we best um, serve the needs of our students and families during this closure. Our focuses are really right now around physical needs for students and families. Uh, the social emotional needs and academic needs. So I'm going to uh, touch on a few of the things going on in each of those. Um, first of all, physical needs, as I mentioned, all um, we are closed. That includes all attendance centers. Um, as Juan mentioned, it does also now include our outdoor facilities. Uh, we are looking at how to post signs and um, potentially be able to rope off playground equipment, things of that nature to help um, discourage um, students congregating at those locations. But all sites are closed. Um, the only exceptions there, we have a few essential things such as serving lunches, which I'll touch on in a moment. Um, we also are continuing to provide uh, childcare from one attendance center. Throughout the school year, we have Kids Inc. Um, who provides both before and after school childcare in our facilities and then um, expands that during the summer or um, holidays. They are currently um, serving just from Longfellow Elementary. We are able to expand that if the need should arise um, for childcare for some of our essential workers, for example. So that's been a partnership um, really statewide looking at how do we ensure that there are sufficient spots for childcare for um, our medical workers, um, first responders, things of that nature. As far as um, other physical needs, one of the um, primary concerns anytime school is closed is ensuring that uh, students have access to food. We began on Tuesday um, in Marion Independent serving um, grab and go lunches um, or lunches and breakfasts. So, Families are able to come to um, a couple different sites. We serve from 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. at Vernon Middle School, and then from 10 to 12 at Vernon Longfellow Elementary, um, Starry Ele Elementary, and Francis Marion. Families are able to come, um, they drive up. We have a staff member who greets them um, outside, asks how many lunches they need, and provides a, a bag that has lunch and breakfast. Uh, we started on Monday, let's see, we served 150 meals or, or bags, so two meals per bag um, on Monday, Tuesday 201, Wednesday 229. That number seems to climb daily across the metro area. Um, we have received quite a bit of feedback from families that for some it's challenging to come daily. 
So starting next week for Marion the Independent, we are moving to serving only on Mondays and Thursdays. Families will be able to come and they pick up on Monday, they will pick up um, meals for three days. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then come back Thursday again to be able to receive meals for Thursday, Friday. Uh, we were able to communicate that out to families yesterday and heard lots of positive um, feedback that that will help ease the burden uh, for those coming to try and pick up meals. We also have some families who receive um, or students who participate in what's called the backpack program where they may they during the school year receive a backpack with um, additional food for the weekend. Families who participate in that, um, we're working in partnership with HACAP and our school counselors. HACAP has um, basically boxes of food that we will help um, connect our families who are typically part of our backpack program uh, with additional boxes of food to ensure that they, that not just the um, school lunches, but they have sufficient food in the household. Um, in addition, so kind of the next step, the social emotional learning needs. Um, as a district, we're very focused on um, the social emotional aspect and recognizing that if those needs are not met, we don't get to the academic needs. There's a lot of um, struggles for families that look very different across homes right now. Some families are um, taking the school closure and the, the changes in stride, and for others, this is presented um, quite a few challenges. And so our focus as a district right now, we have, um, we have teachers reaching out weekly uh, to students. So at the elementary, that would be the classroom teacher reaching out their, to their class. High school, um, middle school, it would be their mentor teacher. Um, part of that is just checking in to make sure, does your family have access to food? How are you doing? Do you need any um, suggestions in setting up routine? Uh, our goal is really meet families where they're at right now and recognizing for some families, um, just getting by day by day is the focus. And so how can we support that social emotional need? We're working with families, whether that's they need help in setting up a routine, um, suggestions for schedules, uh, they don't have enough food and where can we um, help bridge that gap? But part of our goal is just coordinating um, families with resources. We do have school counselors who are available to be able to um, check in with students by phone or virtually um, if needed. We also partner with Tanninger Place and Tanninger has extended um, their services. They work with a number of um, students throughout the year, but will certainly um, help support any additional families or students who are struggling during this time. And then that moves me kind of to the academic or instructional aspect. Um, why, why schools are here, but if those other things aren't met, we, we don't get to the academic aspect. On Tuesday, we did send out electronically across the district um, a link to a variety of resources for students um, for academic enrichment. None of those are required. And so that's been the focus is we wanna provide support um, for learning to continue for, for kids who are able to engage in that. Um, but it is at this time during closure, um, we are not, we're not grading, we're not providing credit for courses. Um, we are simply trying to support continued learning and really um, minimize learning loss during this time um, and giving families permission that if you are not in a place where um, having daily school works in your schedule, that's okay for right now. Um, there are social emotional needs that can be met. It might be family um, meal planning or um, just an opportunity to sit down and play a game together as a family. Those are important learning aspects right now as well. So just like we do with kids um, every day in the classroom, our goal for all of our staff is meet families where they're at um, and try and support our families in whatever those needs are. If you are hearing from anybody in the community that there's a family struggling, um, their teacher, the, the student's teacher is the best first contact. Building principal would be a, another helpful step. Um, as far as academic needs or if there's special education needs, uh, our assistant superintendent Gretchen Kriegel would be a great contact. Um, food service, we have Brenda Carraway as our director um, and our business manager have both partnered in that. And if there's any other general concerns or you're just not sure how to 
how to reach out to the right, right person, I would encourage people just to email or contact me. All staff do have access to email as well as can call in um, remotely to their district office phone. So you're welcome to leave a message with any staff member and they should be able to get back to you. So thank you for the community partnership. Um, I said this before, but I'm gonna say it again. We live in an outstanding community and that's, that's really a blessing. So thank you. Janelle, thank you. Really appreciate that information. We'll, uh, we'll head north now to Mr. Bisgard. Uh, Shannon, the floor is yours. Look, everything Janelle just said, I should just say ditto for because she pretty much covered everything. Um, and that's not by accident. As she mentioned, we've worked very closely together, um, not just the two districts, but with our other metro district as well, the Cedar Rapids and College community. Uh, she mentioned our communication back and forth, whether it's been through Zoom meetings like this or constant text messaging, emailing back and forth to really uh, help coordinate and uh, kind of learn from each other as we go through this process and try to figure out what is best. So I just want to really echo that piece as well. That partnership has been absolutely invaluable uh, these last couple of weeks, especially. But it goes beyond that, I think, as well. Um, we've had multiple times we have needed clear guidance from the state um, to reach out to. And um, Senator Mathis, Representative Hinson, as well as Representative Donahue, they've been extremely responsive to us. If we have sent a text or an email, it's almost been scary how fast they've gotten back to us and how fast they have um, taken action on our behalf. And we've really appreciated that. Uh, from the food supports that we had to modify to academic supports that we're still working through. Um, that has been critical for us because this is new for everybody and we, um, we're all we're look, working together on that piece very closely. So the other piece that's been really uh, kind of fun to watch as well as uh, support from the Department of Education, Department of Public Health. We've really followed the guidance of our uh, state level leaders and county level leaders in that piece. Um, we are not pandemic experts. So we're going to follow the leadership on what is best to do um, in those areas. And that's really helped kind of guide our work. Um, as Janelle mentioned, the governor recommended a four week school shutdown. We have um, followed that request technically in the second week of that shutdown right now, but we are on spring break for one week as well as Marion was too. So we have two more weeks on that time frame. Um, we really, really hope we're able to get back to school on April 13th. As I know other schools do as well. And I'm sure families are really wanting that too. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. Um, that information will come later as we gather more information. Um, but we're evolving and really working to be prepared uh, regardless of which outcome happens. If we go back on the 13th or if we go back on a later date, or even if we don't go back at all this school year, we're putting contingency plans together to be prepared for those scenarios. Um, when the first announcement came out about um, coronavirus and schools being impacted, our our priorities really became clear. Um, taking care of our people was first and foremost and um, almost first to last. And that includes our students, our families, and our staff. So I'll briefly touch base on how we're doing those three things right now. Um, students, that's been our key focus right away, making sure the basic needs are met. Janelle mentioned the lunch programs. Um, our representatives and senators have been critical making that happen. There was a lot of red tape we had to cut through to get um, the modified plans in place. And then we were able to do that thanks to their help. So at Linmar, that looks basically, we have 10 sites that we are providing um, grab and go lunches, very, very similar to what Marion is doing. Um, six school sites, and then we have four offsite locations as well, trying to make it easier for kids and families to access those. Uh, we started that on Monday. Our numbers have gone up every day. Um, right now we're averaging 592 students per day coming through. They, as well, like Marion, they get a lunch and a breakfast for the next day in that, in that sack of that bag lunch. So that's essentially 1,184 meals a day we're providing on average right now. Um, as I said, those numbers have increased every day. I think that'll continue um, to see that grow as well. Um, our food service staff has been phenomenal, trying to change everything they do in a very short period of time to make this happen. Um, we also have a huge list of volunteers that have said, hey, I'm willing to come help serve lunches and help make them if that is necessary. So far, we haven't had to do that yet, but I think that time is coming um, as soon as even as early as next week. Um, another area we're trying to help to, uh, support our families and our kids is through childcare. This is a tough conversation for us. Uh, we close schools. How do we keep child cares open in our schools? That was a conversation we had to work through. Um, the Department of Education, Department of Human Services, state level, um, guidance for us is they really, really strongly encourage that we keep daycares open um, at our schools. And at Linmar, we have two providers that do before and after school daycare 
then on non-school days they do daycare um, full-time at our elementaries on those days. So hand in hand and the YMCA are our partners. So after much discussion and trying to make sure we support the families and our um, essential service workers to make sure they can go to work and do their jobs, we did keep um, all of our sites open at our seven elementaries. Um, as of right now, the numbers have been very low in those programs. Um, which isn't really surprising, I don't think. Families are trying to keep their kids home and keep them isolated, which we all appreciate. Um, but what that has still allowed those some flexibility right now, the, instead of having seven sites, we actually have only two sites open due to the numbers, but we'll continue to offer that service um, as long as the Iowa Department of Public Health tells us that is what is needed. Um, instructionally for students, as Janelle mentioned, this has been a, um, a learning curve for us. We have tried to go from what I think is a, a complete people relationship um, service that we provide and go exclusively work from home and online. And that is a, a daunting task we've all had to work through. The guidance we've been given from the Department of Education has been very helpful as we've worked through that. And I do think this will continue to evolve over time as we all learn what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we've done very similar things to what Janelle mentioned at Marion as far as offering resources for families, making sure they have the information they need, the resources they need. Uh, we are expecting our teachers to reach out to their students and stay in contact. Um, and I've heard from a few families that it's almost too much. Um, too many people, too many emails, too many offers of support, which um, is great feedback for us to get, but I think it's also a positive. Um, I'd much rather have families know that our teachers and staff are caring and trying to help them. Um, if that's too much, then we'll adjust that. And those are plans we are adjusting into next week as well, we'll modify how we do that. Um, it's a little bit challenging trying to offer education in a, a situation where we can't require the work to be done. You guys know how that is when you were a student. If a teacher didn't require it, you maybe or maybe did not do that work. Um, that is the situation we're in right now, but uh, we will continue to offer um, online resources for our kids, especially the high school levels. We move forward that look a little bit differently in upcoming weeks, I think as well as we have learned some things and as we continue to evolve and really depends on if we're back in school in two weeks or if we're extended longer, we'll need to change how we do things there as well. And we're, we're planning um, on a daily basis to figure out how that looks as well. Um, for our staff, you know, one of the main things we really want to do right away is take away that pressure of what, what does this mean to me? How, what happens to my family? Will I lose my job? And one thing we really want to do is keep our family, our educators whole through this process. So our board, um, took the initiative and had a resolution on Monday to make sure that at least through this April 10th closure time period that we are paying all of our staff members for their positions when they're working from home or we do some staff on site working, uh, making sure buildings are clean, food services provided, those type of things. We'll revisit that if we have to as time goes on, but that is critical um, for everybody at this stage to have that, um, at least that level of comfort as they work through this stress. Um, as well as Janelle mentioned too, we, our counselors have been very active trying to make sure to support our students if they need um, any extra assistance. This is a very much a stressful time for families and kids um, are not immune to that stress as well. So we have had a lot of action through our counselor department and our uh, families reaching out to our counselors, which we're appreciative of and want to make sure that continues to, to happen so we can support them in any way. And also for our staff, this is different and stressful for our staff members as well. So we're trying to make sure that they know those counseling services are available um, for them as well. So uh, the last thing I guess I'll mention, well, two things that Janelle mentioned, our facilities are closed. We are completely shut down the district um, and we have moved to the outdoor shutdown as well. Um, as we've worked with our parks, the rec department of the city of Marion to be consistent with that across the board. So our parks will be in the process of being closed today, actually. And our schools and all the activities remain closed for at least the next two weeks as well. The other thing that we're still trying to find the proper balance on is board meetings. Uh, heard Lon mention going to an electronic board meeting coming up and we're still in debate if we are going to do a full electronic board meeting. Our next one is April 6th. Um, if we're gonna do more of a hybrid model where we have a small audience allowed into board meetings and the rest of it done electronically. Uh, we have two weeks to figure out the exact details of that. We want to stay as open and transparent as we can for our community. We also want to make Make sure we're following all the guidelines from the health department as well. So uh, we don't have a final answer on that topic yet, but we're, we're working through that and we will have that before the April 6th board meeting as well. So I think that's all I have. I just want to re-echo what Janelle finished with as well. 
the community support. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to live in this community all the time, but especially in times like this. So people reaching out to offer to help um, support any way they possibly can and the collaboration um, is always appreciated and now more than ever. So thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Shannon. Uh, great job on your update and uh, this leadership that your team's providing as well. Um, so this is a uh, this is a response, and uh, I guess what I'm saying is all levels of government are engaged in this uh, in this uh, response and navigating this together. So we want to do that at the state level, and I will begin with uh, Senator Liz Mathis. Uh, Senator Mathis, you might have muted, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Nick. I'm watching C-SPAN right now. It looks like uh, the House is introducing the bill, or um, it looks like House members are seated and ready for the vote on the stimulus package. But I wanted to thank Medco so much for doing this. Uh, we had a caucus meeting yesterday, and um, you're way ahead of the curve in pulling the community together and answering questions. So thank you, Nick. Um, what I'm seeing in correspondence right now is an uptick uh, with uh, unemployment questions and an uptick in small business questions. Um, also asking the governor to do certain things. Of course, um, you know, the isolation issue is on the minds of people. Um, a lot of questions around essential services. What are essential services? Um, just generalized questions that we could try to resource and we ask them to call 211 um, if they need some help. So that's, that's one of the, the the things that we are pushing. Um, and please um, know that we're part of a daily call with the county and also a twice a week call with our congressional members so that we can share information vis-a-vis uh, -vis the stimulus bill or anything that's going along, you know, around um, along on in Lynn County Public Health. Um, feel free to reach out to Ashley or to me uh, so that if you want to get a message to the governor or you want uh, to get a message to uh, department directors, uh, not unlike what we've done with our superintendents, we have an email thread and we just keep that hot every day. We ask them questions about what their needs are each day and we can get it in front of those department directors fairly quickly. Um, We've both Ashley and I have been posting a lot of things to Facebook as has Representative Donahue. So the minute that the governor's office sends us something or an association sends us something, we just put that out on Facebook. We strip it out and put it out as a media release or um, information that we think uh, the business community or the healthcare community, uh, the education community will see that. Um, today I'm going to talk about healthcare. Uh, unemployment, small business, and if I have some time left, we had a conversation with uh, Mike Egg or with um, <laughs> Mike Nang, who's uh, the director of the Department of Agriculture, and that might be something that some of our um, lenders would want to hear about um, ag business and ag loans. So, in healthcare, just briefly, at a state level, we're just really doing our best to try to be flexible and uh, work around some of the restrictions that we have and kind of uh, be more creative. It's rather hard at a government level to do that, but we're really trying hard to do it. So uh, you've heard on the news trying to get PPE out to hospitals, the personal protective equipment out to hospitals. And, um, and collectively, the National Guard is, is helping with those deliveries. And Lynn County was scheduled to get a delivery yesterday. Um, telehealth has greatly expanded. So even if you have someone um, in the Marion area who not only is a physician who is calling their patient directly or a psychiatrist who is calling a, a client directly, we have been told uh, that they will be covered by not only Medicaid, but also by private insurance. Um, and at least Wellmark has told us that they will do um, cost sharing around telehealth in that regard. We've also been getting pretty uh, creative with telehealth in areas like um, a sheltered workshop or um, things where uh, groups meet on a regular basis and maybe caseworkers can't get to people. We've been very concerned with the acutely disabled community because like Options of Lynn County, they have a sheltered workshop or a day have, and now those are adults, uh, adult children that are going home and they're uh, about 30% of them are with elderly parents who are not well equipped to take care of their adult children all day long. So we've been working on how 
um, about 35 uh, Lynn County workers uh, would not be furloughed, that they would be able to transfer what they do on a day-to-day -day basis from the day hab or the sheltered workshop and visit the home following CDC protocol, taking their temperatures twice a day before they enter the home and, and so on and so forth. So those kinds of issues are coming before us. Um, uh, Cross-functional duties, conversations around essential services, daycare issues, as Janelle said, Healthcare professionals certainly are our first priority in getting um, their kids some daycare. Um, nonprofits who do health care are now included in the emergency relief around unemployment. That was uh, very critical, I think, um, to have that at a stimulus level, at the federal level. And that will uh, really greatly enable us at a state level to allow for, for unemployment benefits. Um, so let me start with some of the health provisions that we do see in the stimulus bill. Um, and this is important to our business community because a lot of you run supply chains to healthcare organizations, to the hospitals, to physicians, um, and, and what uh, the other business community might do is feel the ripple effect of this if some of those small businesses are shut down when uh, they, they don't have enough money, the healthcare workers don't have enough money to purchase. So, so what the Department of Health and Human Services is issuing is $140.4 billion. And that includes public health and social service emergency funds, including $100 billion for grants to hospitals, to public entities, not-for-profit entities, to Medicare and Medicaid, and enrolled suppliers and institutional providers. Now, when we, right before we left, Ashley and I uh, and Molly were part of a, a, an appropriations bill. It was an emergency bill that added uh, 80 plus um, million dollars to our Medicaid system. Some of the other things that we've told people who are on Medicaid, they will not be taken off Medicaid under any circumstances. Some of our Medicaid people pay premium costs and those will be waived. And so we wanna make sure that everybody has healthcare in a critical time. We also, the stimulus bill shows $275 million to expand services and capacity for rural hospitals and telehealth around that, which is critical for them. Um, and these are the highlights, $425 million to substance abuse and mental health uh, services administration, so that's SAMHSA. Um, and $100 million for flexible funding to address mental health substance abuse uh, disorders for youth and homeless during this time. Um, and under the human services headline, 6.3 billion overall to the administration for children and families. Some of that funding will, will permeate into uh, the Department of Ed as well. So as Janelle and Shannon were saying, um, we're, we're very concerned about families who are at home when they normally are not home all the time together and now they're in, more in isolation. And so we wanna make sure that caseworkers are calling them, that uh, I've heard that a lot of teachers are personally calling uh, you know, parents, and that's a good thing. So all those checks on kids are essential. Uh, there's also 45 million in grants uh, to states for child welfare services. Um, then let's get into uh, direct payments for citizens. We've heard a lot of questions around you know, when these direct payments might be made. I guess uh, Steve Mnuchin said that possibly April 6th, I think that's um, pretty rosy, but if that's their goal, then let's hope that that happens. And you can read, you know, in the newspaper, you know what uh, those direct payments are gonna be like. Um, it's uh, individuals 1,200, married couples 2,400, and $500 per child younger than age 17. Uh, middle American incomes and, and uh, Americans with, um, uh, you know, they have to have a certain criteria uh, in their income in order to get the stimulus money. Um, it's 75000 uh, 150000 for couples, 75000 for individuals. Anyone making over 99000 would not get a payment. And um, so, so there's that. April 6th is, is when they hope that they can get those stimulus checks out. Um, in terms of unemployment benefits, we've just seen a wide range of people asking questions about the gig economy, if you're self-employed, if you're part-time, um, if you were, you were a brand new employee and you just got laid off. So those questions you can ask, um, I will workforce development, but what the stimulus bill that they're now looking at in the House, U.S. House, shows is there's $360 million for the Department of Labor to invest 
in programs that provide training and supportive services for dislocated workers. It expands uh, unemployment insurance from three to four months and provides temporary unemployment compensation of 600 per week, which is in addition to in the same time uh, as regular state and federal benefits. Uh, Part-time self-employed gig economy workers now have access. It allows employers to receive an advanced tax credit from the treasury instead of having to be reimbursed on the back end. 260 billion investment into the unemployment insurance program. And as you've heard from the governor at a state level, our trust fund is at 1.7 billion. So um, we're, we're doing very well and we'll be able to turn those unemployment benefits around. Um, our local or our uh, statewide IWD, Iowa Workforce Development Director Beth Townsend said they have just been processing claims and they are caught up, which is miraculous. It's just miraculous. Um, the Emergency Relief and Taxpayer Protections authorizes the Secretary of the Treasury to make loans, loan guarantees, and other investments in support of eligible businesses, states, and municipalities that do not in the aggregate exceed 500 billion. For labor-related provisions, um, I'm just kind of looking through all the highlights here. Uh, 10 billion for the Small Business Administration, SBA emergency grants of up to $10,000 to provide immediate relief for operating costs, um, and 17 billion for the SBA to cover six months of payments for small businesses with existing SBA loans, rent, mortgage, utility costs now eligible for SBA loan forgiveness. And I'll send this overview to Nick and he can redistribute it to those who are interested in seeing this that are online right now. Um, the direct payments to families, um, okay, covered that. Uh, and I emphasize the deadlines for some of these programs. Um, really watch the deadlines for some of the, the small business programs, which are, in the state of Iowa, Debbie Durham has announced an Iowa Small Business Relief Grant and Tax Deferral uh, Program, a targeted small business sole operator relief fund, so that's sole operators. Um, and under the Iowa Small Business Relief Grants, it's for businesses of two to 25, and the sole proprietor obviously is an individual. There may be some, uh, I know some uh, salon owners or people who are uh, you know, renting space as a salon, uh, as a hair cutter, beautician, um, they're running into some issues around their contractual obligations with uh, uh, people who lease space to them, but they're working things out. Um, also on the Iowa Workforce Development and IEDA site, you'll see that there's a foreclosure suspension um, that the governor put in a March 22nd uh, proclamation, um, an eviction suspension that was uh, also in a March 20th proclamation. Um, and then for, again, for federal programs, we've talked about the SBA loans. Um, make sure that you work with your bank on that. Um, CDBG grant funds also are available to a lot of different counties, although Lynn County, or this, I should say Cedar Rapids, is not uh, one of those areas, but I'm not sure maybe um, uh, Nick might be able to talk about CDBG with Marion. Um, Medco had a wonderful SBA uh, loan uh, teleconference the other day, and we heard from the SBA person in Des Moines, and then we heard from um, business people who were talking about, you know, um, what they should do. Should they go ahead and apply or not? And Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you can apply um, and you can wait until they tell you perhaps how much is available for you after you fill out all the information. You do not have to accept that loan if uh, stimulus money comes along that's going to be better for you. So there are options here. You're not locked into that. Another thing, Mark and I, my husband and I own a small business with 50 people, and it has been amazing how our lender has reached out to us and uh, had a great conversation with us. And so uh, if there are bankers and credit union people on the line, please reach out to your customers, your clients, uh, let them know that um, what's available to them, what you can do for them locally. And I think that will ease a lot of tension right now. But um, a lot of things that I've been seeing in my email box are about unemployment. And unfortunately, I haven't had any emails like that. 
uh, over the course of the years since our unemployment has been so low, but now it's soaring and people are kind of caught flat footed. So that's what I have, Nick. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Mathis. Yeah, on those SBA loans, and really, even as the, the U.S. House approves this phase three package that we're um, eagerly waiting to just have adopted so that we can move forward, um, Liz, you mentioned the importance of really having a strong relationship with your uh, financial institution. But number two, especially with some of the tax-related issues that will come from this federal piece, maybe just as equally as a strong partnership with your CPA, your yes. accountant. Um, we posted some links to some online webinars that RSM has made publicly accessible uh, on our COVID resource page. Uh, those are really important um, individuals and resources to tap into because all, all of this is new. Anytime you use the word tax, uh, I really acknowledge I'm quickly in over my head. So now is where it pays dividends to have a strong relationship with your financial partner and, and, and your CPA. And have a, have a good communication with your employees. So um, if you have to lay off someone or you furlough someone, make sure that you just check the unemployment uh, eligibility around that. Um, you know, Debbie Durham and um, Beth Townsend said yesterday that you have to use up your paid leave. But if your, um, if your employer cannot pay that out, that has to be proven. So, so make sure that you contact IWD or you uh, talk with you know, uh, some resources or your accountant before you do that to make sure that um, you, know, you don't run into any issues when you do get stimulus money or when you do uh, take an SBA loan because there might be some requirements around that if you lay off people and the job's not there when they come back, so. Okay, thank you, Liz. Also, just one note, for those of you that did participate in the SBA, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan webinar that we did on Monday, I, I think it was the first webinar that the SBA did after the Saturday uh, declaration that we received. There've been a couple of changes that, if those of you are familiar with what this program uh, offered back during the period of the flood, it, it's a very similar program. And there's a lot of, I think, individuals that when they look back on this afterwards, they realize there's some, a lot you need to think about uh, when you're considering this particular tool. But this time around, there have been two changes specifically since our webinar. One, they are not requiring uh, tax returns to be uploaded at the time of application. That's regardless of the loan size that you might, might ask for. And second, according to our SBA representatives, the SBA is not requiring personal assets to be used as collateral. That, that is significant uh, this time around. So just a couple of notes. Uh, if you happen to go in and watch the webinar that we, had, that we have posted uh, to medcoiowa.org that we facilitated on Monday, we made some added notes in there in red text because those notes are different than what you would hear uh, during the webinar. So um, with that, uh, Representative Hinson is also uh, on the line here, and uh, Ashley, I'll open the floor to you at this point. All right, thanks a lot, Nick, and thanks to everyone who's on today. It's uh, great to see so many people um, connecting this way via Zoom. Um, we are one of those families where we've had to figure out how to homeschool our kids in the last couple of weeks, and so uh, my husband is manning the fort while I, while I do this today. So we're, we're working parents, so thanks for, um, for doing this, Nick, and uh, bringing everybody together. So um, I wanted to focus a little bit on the state um, response and as well as the federal um, stimulus package as far as education is concerned, and then also talk a little bit about transportation. I chaired the transportation committee um, last session in the House, so um, I see how that's very very well connected with commerce and keeping our supply chain going. So I wanted to pass on a couple of those updates as well. But um, first thing, Liz touched on the uh, the additional package that we passed as we suspended session last week that did give the governor some additional powers to be able to spend from the economic emergency fund, which was statutorily full as well as our cash reserves. But I think uh, you know, Liz used the word rosy, and we. this is not a rosy situation. I think we are in a good situation where we can handle some of these things right away, but uh, the economic impact of this is very unclear. So um, I, I have a feeling that we're gonna have to come back. Um, the REC just met a few weeks ago um, and issued their forecast that we're supposed to be budgeting on at the state level. And I think that's pretty much out the window. 
um, based upon what I'm hearing. So we're trying to figure out what that's going to look like as we return to session, um, hopefully in a few weeks. But um, as the federal funds uh, come to the state of Iowa, I checked with our staff this morning, we won't have to be present in Des Moines to be able to uh, get those funds dispersed to where they need to go. It sounds like because of the federal block grant bill that we passed last year, uh, we already have a mechanism in place for the state to draw down those dollars and pass them on. Um, so I think that's important to note that once that aid starts flowing, we're going to be able to get it out as a state um, as soon as it comes in the door. Um, so a state level response to this situation, um, the, the, there's a task force meeting right now through the Department of Education to move forward on distance learning. Um, Director Lebo will actually be taking part in the governor's press conference at 2.30 this afternoon. So if you're interested in the most recent update, uh, definitely tune in to her press conference at 2.30. Um, but they are looking at specifically four pathways that Iowa schools have to start looking at um, to move forward with continuous learning at home, um, specifically um, any considerations they need to be making, um, standardized for statewide distribution. We wanna make sure that this is equitable um, and that um, you know obviously some of the challenges that um, Janelle and Shannon talked about with not necessarily requiring these of all students because the resources maybe aren't there right now. So we're trying to figure out you know, how do we do that and provide that education to everybody um, in a uniform way. Um, also an expedited process for districts that want to offer um, online education for credit um, for the duration of this emergency, any AEA resources that we might need to be looking at um, to get to districts and schools so that they can um, help to provide these options. Um, and then also the capacity of our current three online providers because we want to be able to provide these services to schools and students, we need to make sure that that's enough bandwidth that we can do that going forward. Um, as far as the federal package is concerned, um, it does provide um, $30.75 billion for the Education Stabilization Fund. Um, and that will trickle down to the state of Iowa. We don't actually have a number yet of what that um, amount is going to look like, but the governor will have some discretion going forward and how those funds are dispersed um, for emergency support grants to school districts or institutions of higher education. Um, I actually put in a request to our staffer this morning. Um, a lot of this is in flux and up in the air, but we'll be able to get a better picture probably by earlier next week of what the disbursement of those funds will look like once we know the actual amount. Um, as far as transportation goes, um, the licensing stations all remain open, but only for appointment only for essential services. CDLs, chauffeurs, um, anybody who needs identification to get a new job, because while unemployment claims are surging, there are also a number of employers who, as a result of this crisis, are hiring in bulk. So um, we do want to make sure that people are making appointments to go in and get their driver's licenses. Um, all the rest stops in Iowa are still open as of this point, unless they're um, managed um, by IEDA. So like the welcome centers and things like that are shut down. Um, traffic numbers are down significantly in the state. Um, right now they're uh, right about 37% for personal vehicle use. That means Iowans are heeding the message. They're staying home. They're not out on the roads. Um, but truck traffic does remain steady, which is an important note because as we're talking about that supply chain and keeping that going, um, that's great. Uh, we're getting the needed ice items that we need to get out to grocery stores and our medical facilities. Um, obviously not a whole lot of people are flying right now, but the real ID deadline did get extended by a year. Um, I actually uh, thought it was poignant to mention that there is an incredible impact to our, um, our airports um, here in Iowa. Um, the Eastern Iowa Airport provides about 50% of the uh, the freight, um, for instance, as well as a significant amount of passenger air. So um, right now, passenger volumes are down about 80% at the airport, which um, we would expect to see, but um, that's going to hit them very, very hard going forward. So one of the things that I'm very cognizant of and working with um, our airport directors um, around the state and with uh, the DOT is the economic impact of that going forward and what this federal package is going to mean for our airports and those regional providers um, that fly in and out of uh, the Eastern Iowa Airport and other airports in the area. Um, since schools are closed, just a quick tidbit too, DOT has waived the rules so driver's ed can also be taught virtually. So I think that um, kind of uh, meets the, the needs of our students. We're, we're obviously having to pivot very quickly on a lot of these things so that uh, we can move forward. Um, and then the governor has also waived 
uh, quite a few requirements on vehicle weights, hours of service, and medical cards so that um, the trucking industry can continue to operate. Um, and then finally, one um, keynote, um, road construction projects at, as of this point are continuing statewide. Um, just because we have this, doesn't, this uh, crisis that we're dealing with doesn't mean our needs for infrastructure will uh, be waning. So um, they are definitely prioritizing the contracts uh, with and the projects with their contractors, but um, as of right now, uh, those projects are moving forward. So we should still have a significant um, part of that workforce out there continuing to work on our roads and bridges. So um, that's just kind of a brief update from my perspective. I would echo what Liz said. If um, I'm getting a lot of the same concerns. So if you have any questions for us, please send us an email uh, or give us a call. Um, you know, we're happy to answer your questions going forward. And it is a very fluid situation, so um, we're doing the best we can to get that information out. But, um, you know, I took a call from Connie's Quilt Shop today. She was wondering if she was on the list of businesses to stay open or close. And I got a hold of the governor's office right away, and I have a call with them at 1230. And uh, they've been very responsive, and they said, nope, she's not on the list of people that need to close. So um, Connie's can stay open. So if you're quilting at home right now or deciding to take that up, you're good to go. So uh, with that, that's my quick update for you, Nick. Can't hear. Can't hear. Can't hear. You know, I unmuted your mic, just didn't, didn't unmute mine. Um, we were just texting back and forth. You said there is a quick update on the federal stimulus as well. Yes, yes uh, they passed it. They passed the. Yay. House, they called, uh, a representative called for a record vote, record roll call, and it was denied because the, um, the secretary, the House said uh, that they had a quorum and they could do just a, a motion for just a voice vote. So it is passed and it looks like uh, they're, they're uh, streaming out of the Capitol right now. Um. That, that is all we have for a formal presentation today. If there are any questions that anyone wants to submit, we're happy to consider some of those. Um, while we wait to just anticipate any questions, I just wanna wrap up by saying, uh, we will post this webinar on our website. It should be up there later this afternoon. Um, if you do not get updates from us on a regular basis, you can actually go to our website, medcoiowa.org. On our COVID page, you can sign up uh, you do not need to be an investor or a member of our organization to receive these. Um, we've got a ton of resources on there. We want our site to just be a hub to connect you with all the experts on whatever the topic might be, whether it's SBA benefits, whether it's an explanation of the federal stimulus, whether it's um, sending you to uh, unemployment resources. We, we just want that to be a hub, so watch for that. Also, for those of you who are business owners on this call, I know there are many of you. Um, we are going to start something next Tuesday. We're going to do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right now, we think we're going to call it uh, just an engagement lounge. It'll just be a place where we will be on in an environment like this for you to jump on. You don't need to register, but we will be here uh, for you to bring whatever your latest questions might be. It'll be very informal but we're in the process right now of rolling these out on our website on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 o'clock. Um, I think that's all I have. Um, there's some conversation going on uh, right now. I know that Lon's, Lon's responding for construction co uh, projects. Will contractors be able to get necessary permits and inspections from the city? Uh, city manager responded, yes, we have that built online. Um, I think one of the questions from uh, Cassie about uh, putting your business online to let people know that you're open limited hours, um, that's something I would probably refer you to our Chamber of Commerce on. Uh, Jill, do you have anything you might add on that? I'll unmute your line if you want to add a comment. Uh, Jill is our Chamber President and she's on the call as well. Oops. So I can unmute your plan. Can you try to unmute it on your end? Sorry. There we go. No. Nope. But anyway, for some reason. <laughs> There you are. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have a couple of different ways um, that businesses can make the public aware of um, hours. Uh, 
changes in their hours of operation. The first thing that I would direct you to is our Facebook page. Um, it's it's actually um, a group on the Marion Chambers Facebook page. It's Marion Delivery, Carryout, and Curbside. You can go in and um, change any of your hours of operation, um, changes in how you want people to pick up. If you are offering delivery, any of those types of things can be posted there. We're also promoting uh, Marion Shop Where I Live. That's our online e-commerce platform. So that's a, um, a good place to check if you're looking, um, if you want to post uh, about your business, things that you offer. If you want to sell online, there's opportunity there. Um, their owner, Sherry, is also allowing any business free of charge um, to sell uh, gift cards on that platform right now. So that's another great opportunity. And then in addition to that, um, open to any business, we're starting some um, online meetings next week. The first one's going to be um, on the 31st, Ask a Banker. So we're going to be covering um, topics like how to manage your payroll, um, when your business is disrupted, going through some of the different programs that you've mentioned today. Um, we're going to do one on employment law the following week. Uh, we'll be covering mental health the week after that. So we've got a whole lineup of um, webinar type, virtual meeting type um, things set up that people can take advantage of. Thank you, Jill. Sure. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have for now. Of course, if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to contact us through our website. Um, we're going to continue to figure out how we can work together to be the highest value possible as a community team uh, to you all. So, uh, thanks again, everybody. We'll work to have this posted on our website later today. Feel free to share that out, and uh, we will stay in touch. So, thank you, everyone, for participating.